Good afternoon, Christian Theological Seminary. I would say it's great to see you, but I really can't see you because of the light. But I am so delighted to welcome you to the third CTS talk of this academic year and the installation of Dr. Francisco Lozada, Jr. I'm delighted that you're here. I want to make a special welcome, a word of welcome to those of you who are guests or here for the first time. A special welcome to um, Dean Lozada's family members. His wife, Wendy, is here, and his mother-in-law, Diane, are here. Th can we say a word of welcome to them? And I want to also do a special welcome to Coro Latino and Americano under the direction of Bruno Sendes. Um, they are part of the ministry at Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Indianapolis. We are delighted delighted that you're here and to celebrate this special occasion with us. They'll be leading us in song and in music throughout the service. Um, and so with that, I invite you to rise as you are able and join in an opening song.
Amen. You may be seated. This year, Christian Theological Seminary is offering a series of CTS talks. These events are providing additional opportunities to celebrate faculty who have been newly appointed to endow chairs and to celebrate our new Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. There is one more CTS talk after this one today on April 11th, when we will hear from Dr. Scott C and install him in the William G. Irwin Chair of Church History. Each of these events follow a similar format. After a brief introductory remarks, we will proceed with the installation followed by the talk. And after the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A and then we hope you'll, enjoy, you'll uh, join us for a celebratory reception in the common room. In spring of 2023, Christian Theological Seminary launched its search for the next Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. The search team, composed of Dr. Bill Kincaid, Dr. Christina Davis, and Dr. Nicole Robertson and me worked with AGB Search to conduct the national search. With input from every sector of the seminary, we composed a profile to be shared with applicants. I must say our expectations were pretty high. 24 people were nominated, 12 people officially applied, the search team conducted interviews with three candidates, and two of those candidates were invited to an on-campus visit and interview. The CTS community was clear that Dr. Francisco Lozada was the right and best person to lead the faculty and guide the academic life of the seminary at this point in its history. I was very excited about welcoming Dr. Lozada to the team. And now that I have had the opportunity to work with him these past seven months, I am even more pleased to have the honor of working side by side with him. As you all know, the Dean plays a critical role in the life of the school, especially in a school that has the diversity of programs that CTS has. In his role, Dr. Lozada interacts with students, faculty, staff, trustees, partner organizations, and friends of the seminary. And while I may be his supervisor, we share a constituency which is wide and deep. And members of the CTS community are invested in the success of the seminary and its performance, which I greatly appreciate. Dr. Lozada arrives at CTS and in this position with a tremendous amount of scholarly and administrative experience, as we will hear about shortly. And he arrives here at a crucial moment when we are reimagining and reemerging as an institution committed to being healthy and strong, an organization that has a positive impact in the fields of theology and counseling and is a catalyst for bringing God's love, justice, and liberation to the world. Welcome, and I'm glad you're here for the celebration. Good afternoon. I'm Amy Lindemann Allen, the Indiana Christian Church Associate Professor of New Testament Studies here at CTS. And today it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you my colleague in New Testament Studies, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dean of the Faculty, and trusted mentor and friend, Dean Francisco Lozada, Jr. Dr. Lozada is a child of Roman Catholic Puerto Rican parents and he was born not all that far from here in Cleveland, Ohio. He continues to maintain his faith life in the Roman Catholic Church, together with a strong ecumenical interfaith commitment and relationships. 
Dean Lozada holds a PhD in New Testament and Early Christianity from Vanderbilt University, an MTS from Vanderbilt Divinity School, and a BA in Religious Studies from John Carroll University. Prior to coming here to Christian Theological Seminary, Dean Lozada served on the faculty of Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas, as the Charles Fisher Catholic Professor of New Testament and Latinx Studies and the director of the Borderlands Institute and Latinx Studies program there. In that capacity, he directed several webinars on the topic of immigration and co-led multiple travel seminars in the southern border. Dr. Lozada has served extensively in leadership roles across the New Testament Guild, including significant leadership in the Society of Biblical Literature, especially its program units in minoritized criticism and poverty in the biblical world, and notably as a mentor in the Hispanic Theological Initiative. He also continues to serve on the board for the Hispanic Summer Program, guiding its efforts to shape the next generation of Latinx theological and ecclesial leaders. Dean Lozada is a prominent voice across the country addressing hermeneutical and theological implications for how the Bible is employed and deployed in ethnic racial communities. He has authored and co-edited numerous books, too many for me to read to you today, but most relevant perhaps to our topic, Latino, Latina, Theology and the Bible, Ethnic Racial Reflections on Interpretation, Towards a Latino, Latina, Biblical Interpretation, Latino, Latina, Biblical Hermeneutics, Problematics, Objectives, Strategies, and Soundings in Cultural Criticism, Perspectives and Methods in Culture, Power, and Identity in the New Testament. Dean Lozada has also authored extensive collections of book chapters, academic and ecclesial articles on topics ranging from pedagogy, critical methodology, Latino biblical interpretation, globalization, and Methan and Johannine exegesis. Today's talk is actually based upon one of those articles that Dean Lozada authored for a forthcoming volume on multiracial biblical studies. This article is entitled Unpeeling Whiteness, a reading of US immigration history alongside US biblical interpretations. Dean Lozada, I'm grateful for your work and for the ways in which you guide all of us as we continue to seek God's word in a changing and multicultural world. Thank you. It is our honor to call Dr. Francisco Lozada, Jr. to serve Christian Theological Seminary as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. I thank the community of Christian Theological Seminary, trustees, faculty, staff, and students past and present for the opportunity to share your mission and serve among you. Thank you for accepting this invitation to serve, lead, and inspire. Dr. Lozada, as the coordinating architect of curricula, you are called to construct and maintain educational programs for the benefit of our students, the wider church, and the world at large. You are called to supervise all aspects of the educational experience, nurturing and engaging our student community in open dialogue, assisting in problem solving, goal setting, and working with a team of faculty and staff to ensure each student is supported with a whole student experience that is conducive to personal and professional growth. We bless you and will support you in this work of inspiring growth and giving oversight to academic, spiritual, and professional formation. Dr. 
We call you to hire, cultivate, and support a diverse faculty as you facilitate, facilitate collegial conversations, grow new skills and knowledge in your educational team, and celebrate a community with a wide range of gifts. We bless you in this crucial work of selecting, nurturing, and caring educators. Dr. Francisco Lozada, Jr., you have been called by Christian Theological Seminary to serve as our Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty, representing the seminary and serving as an ambassador for our mission to serve God's transforming of the world. You are called to work in partnership with the president, faculty, staff, trustees, and alumni in service to the students and the wider constituencies of the seminary. With prayerful consideration of these duties and responsibilities, will you answer this call and commit to serving God in this community of learning in Christ's name? I will. Relying on God's guidance and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of the board and the seminary community, I rejoice in declaring that you are officially installed as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Christian Theological Seminary. While you're standing, I'll invite you to join me in prayer. <laughs> I try to catch you before you get down. <laughs> Let us pray. Holy God, vulnerable God, creative God, you place the sun in the heavens, set the planets on their course. From your womb, you brought forth human beings created in your image. In every age, you raise up prophets, friends, and leaders to proclaim your vision for the world, to speak your word of life, to join you in the act of making the world new. For 100 years, your spirit has been alive and active in the life and work of our school. You have been shaping and forming us to learn, to celebrate, to receive, and to share your life-giving and liberative love. On this auspicious day, we ask your blessing on our new colleague, Dean, Vice President, Dr. Francisco Lozada, Jr. We know that you have prepared him for this work. You have sustained and guided him so that he may join in your magnificent vision for the church and the world. We give thanks to every person, community, institution, and relationship that has contributed to Dr. Lozada's personal and professional development. We give special thanks for his wife, Wendy, his daughter, Anna, his son, Nico, and his entire family for supporting him in his role as Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. The seminary community and Dr. Lozada have made clear their commitments to each other here today. Provide Dean Lozada with every grace he needs to guide and care for our faculty, to inspire and mentor our students, to lead and encourage our staff, to ignite a passion in all of us to serve your transformation of the world. Grant us all a double portion of your Holy Spirit and the grace to remember that you are not finished with us yet. You are not finished with Christian Theological Seminary. You, holy God, mighty God, and gracious God are still speaking, yes. still creating, and still drawing us into deeper life with you. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now, and forever. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. I don't even know what to say after such a beautiful prayer, but we're going to try to do it the best way we know, that's by singing and praising. Um, I invite you all to join us. Oh, Bruno, but I do not speak Spanish. Coro is made up of members from nine different countries, not only from Latin America, but also from Europe. So even if you don't speak Spanish today, I promise by the end of today, you'll probably be bilingual or thinking you can speak. So, and if you cannot sing along, please feel free if the spirit moves you to move and sing with us.
Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. I guess so. Thank you. Thank you to the Corro Latino Americano. Gracias por todo. <sighs> Sorry. I didn't give you instructions on which song to sing because I knew I would break up. That was my mother's favorite. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so I, <laughs> she loved that. She sang it all the time. I grew up with it. So it's thank you. I go to, I, I've, I've been listening to them since I've arrived here in Indianapolis only because I lost my mother within the last year and she was a very religious person. And so when I go there, I hear my parents um, and they're sort of all the songs and, and of course it touches me. My home, of course, is here in the US, but my spirit is in Latin America. Um, so um, before I, let me just say a quick, quick thanks to Wendy before I forget her. <laughs> my wife. Um, she's been on my journey for many, many years. Uh, we met at Vanderbilt Divinity School some years ago in the library. Um, and, um, and so she's the one who introduced me to the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. I had no idea who they were. Um, and so, and of course, my mother-in-law, Diane Chaston, um, whose descendants actually, actually go way far to the French Huguenots, for those who might be interested in knowing some of that. So third generation Disciples of Christ Christian Church. So thank you. Um, and thank you to President Malat, my colleagues, staff, students who are here, past and present as well. Thank you very much. I, I'm very honored um, that you are here with me today. Um, unpeeling whiteness. You're probably trying to figure out what exactly this means, right? A Latino perspective on biblical interpretation. What this presentation is about is really about the power of racial scripts. That's what I'm about, right? And some of it stems from growing up in the US, and some of it is, stems from my work on the southern border a little bit, that consciousness sort of thing. I don't do biblical studies in the way that's traditionally done, right? I don't do the traditional exegesis. You know, I do it something slightly different, right? I don't see myself in that light anymore. That happens in your professional career. You change over, over the years. It's not that I don't do it, I still do it. But it's, it's, I see myself much more along the lines of a cultural observer in many ways. And that's what you'll see a little bit here today. So what is a racial script, you probably wonder. A racial script is a form of communication, right? A form of communication that narrates a racialized hierarchy, a racialized hierarchy, right? With whites above, African-Americans, Native Americans, Asians, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, somewhere in the middle, and it fluctuates over historical time and place, right? And so it changes. I see race as a construction. I see ethnicity as a construction as well. So it fluctuates, again, based on time and place. What is whiteness? Whiteness is a, it's not referring to people, per se. Okay, just let's be clear. I'm borrowing a little bit from Willie Jennings, uh, a Yale Divinity Professor of Theology. That's who I'm following here. There's another one also, um, Huerta, Tenoch Huerta. He's a Mexican um, actor, by the way. Um, he has a really good book called Ocurio, Ocurio Prieto. Right, dark skin pride. It's very insightful if you if you get a chance to to read it in Spanish. I don't think it's translated yet in English. So I'm borrowing a little bit uh, on some of that. So whiteness again, a way of being and seeing, right? The way of being and seeing whiteness and how it's employed within our system. So it's not really referring to a person or persons per se. Okay, I want you to get that get that across. It's there. It's in our world. Right? Whiteness is when you say, this is my land, and you take it away from indigenous people. Whiteness is when you go to another continent and steal their people and bring them to the US in 1619. That is whiteness, right? And it seeps through all of our ways of thinking and being who we are. It's, it's the idea that I belong in front of the line because of my appearance, right? It says that I have these certain privileges because of who I am, right? 
It says that I am above the law. It says that I can violate a woman's body and get away with it. Right? That's the ideology of whiteness. And it happens at the macro level, level, but it also happens in my field, theological studies. It happens in biblical interpretation at the same time. It happens not just in the US, it happens in Latin America, it happens in Asia, and it happens in Africa. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a virus that seeps through every single sectors of our, our world. That's what I'm trying to get across in some ways, all right? Let me give you two more examples. June 2015, New York City, Trump Tower. He descends, that is then Donald J. Trump, and says, right, they, reference to Mexico, are sending the worst people. I'm paraphrasing, of course. They're sending their criminals, they're sending their rapists. They're not sending you, they're sending the worst. That is a racial script infused within the ideology of whiteness, which is carried on to today, right? You can just hear the followers of that, of, of Donald J. Trump in that sense, right? That's what I'm talking about in many ways. August, August 2017, right? Charlottesville, Virginia, on the campus of University of Virginia, right? Nativists march around chanting, they will not replace us. They will not replace us. And then it gets morphed. It gets morphed into what? Jews will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. That is what we call replacement theory, and that is a racial script. That is a racial script that they grabbed from another particular period of time, right? And they brought it back to the present, repackaged it, and then presented it again. And if you don't think that plays a role in theology, read the Gospel of John. Read the commentaries on the Gospel of John. Replacement theory is in the commentaries. Guess what? It's in the intro to New Testaments. Right? That's why I prefer not to use that. <laughs> uh, New Testament books who use that in replacement theory. It's subtle. It's the soft, hidden things behind our field. I want to do, what I'm interested in is, is bringing what is invisible out to bring it visible, to bring it to the forefront. It's like taking a logo and bringing it up front, right? Taking that template and bringing it up front. That's what I'm interested in. That's my project, and what you're getting today is simply a little reflection, a little snapshot of what I've been doing and where I'm beginning to develop a little bit more. That's what, that's what I'm about a little bit. I tend to be a theologian who likes to break the rules, right. right? I like to push the edges. I don't want to do what they want me to do. I want to do the things I want to do, right? I want to write my narrative, not follow theirs. So that's, what I'm, that's part of it. So, so let me start this way, right? I'm trying to think of where to start. So I start with a so, the question of social location, right? Social location. Now this is, a, this is on the, a saying on the hillside in Ciudad Juarez, okay? It says, la Biblia es la verdad, léela. The Bible is the truth, read it, right? It serves as a reminder for me today of why the importance of the Bible and biblical interpretation in the midst of immigration issues to this day, right? It serves as a reminder. This, it's, I'm a liberationist, right? That's just, I studied with Enrique Dussel, I met Gustavo Gutierrez, I, I read all that. I met a lot of the Latin American liberation theologians over my life. I got very, very lucky because of my dissertation advisor, put me in touch with a lot of these people. I'm very much interested in how do I protect the rights of the poor and the vulnerable migrants. That's, what it, that's, the un, that's a theological underpinning in everything I do. So I have to start here, right? I have to, this is my, my point of departure in, in many ways in what I, I tend to do. Not too far from here is a processing center, right? And some years ago with students, we went to the processing center 
And we witness a young boy being processed by the Border Patrol. About five foot, maybe 12, 13 years old, dark brown hair, dark brown skin, right? Dark brown eyes, a raggedy shirt, pants, tennis shoes, right? And as we walked into that processing center, as we walked in, we caught eyes. We caught eyes. And my whole class that was surrounding me, we all caught his, caught his eyes. And we just, just dropped. We were, we were, we were moved by, by that experience. And we, to this day, that young boy, I have no idea what happened, but that young boy haunts me to this day. And so when I'm doing this type of work, I'm remembering that boy. That boy is still in my memory. You talk about trauma, it's still there. It's still there. I wrestle with it. I tried to, to, to deal with it through my scholarship in many ways. Why, why, why migration, my immigration? Because they're human beings. Imagine if you stopped saying illegals and call them Christians. Would that change the narrative? Imagine that, imagine that. Christians are evading. Let's see that on cable news. Let's see that on cable news, you see. So this is where my social location, for those who are students here, social location plays a big part in one's hermeneutical approach, or PhD students if they're here, right? You have to understand that social location. Of course, I'm doing very surface level material here, and it's a little bit more complex. There's other, th interesting, I've met asylum seekers. Um, you know, I've, I've gone to hospitality houses. Um, and whatnot. There's also a site near here that is a railroad. Railroads was made, were, were constructed by Asians. You have the Spanish co um, colonization of the indigenous land and so forth. You have Confederate soldiers moving here with their slaves after the Civil War. It's a very interesting spot, El Paso, Texas. And this is where you can see, you can see it from El Paso, Texas, this, this saying. So this to me has stayed with me for many, many years because again, it serves as a reminder of the work that I'm engaged in, um, in my scholarship. And in my, I guess I never use the word so much, but in my activist ways, I guess, in some ways. So let me tell you what I'm about to do here. So we're gonna get to the, the section proper. So what I like to do in my scholarship, or in the classroom, is to combine fields, right? I just don't read Johannine scholarship all day or Matthean scholarship all day. I'm actually more interested in American studies. I'm more interested in Latino studies. I'm interested in Latin American history. I'm interested in a lot of things. Cultural anthropology, for example, cultural history, right? I think it, it, if you put them all together, I think it's more cultural history that, that I tend to do. And so I'm using US immigration history and combining it with biblical interpretation. Right? In some ways, it's, that's a very, if you read the preponderance of literature that I have done on, um, if you want to call it cultural biblical hermeneutics, you'll notice that they all begin with certain, uh, a repertoire, a tactical move that they make. And one of the tactical moves is to begin to combine it with another field. So you could do New Testament and feminist studies, New Testament or interpretation and, and let's say disability studies, ecological studies, that sort of thing, right? Um, and that's a lot of com combining of different fields. We don't simply read redaction critics, at least I don't, redaction, if you know redaction critics, redaction critic all day, right? I like to be doing something different. Like when I teach Galatians, I'm not looking at Lewis Martin's work on Galatians. I know you don't know who he is, maybe. I'm reading Frederick Douglass, I bet you know who that who is. You think Martin knows more about freedom than Douglas? Why should I be reading Martin's work when I can read refer to Douglas alongside Galatians? That's more interesting. And that's fascinating. That's the type of work I like to do, that interdisciplinary work. And so what I've done here, something's missing on the slide. Well, maybe it is. We'll see. And so what I've done here is I like to look at US immigration history primarily in the 20th century to the present to the 20th century to the present. That's what I'm doing here. That's one of the projects. I've done a lot of reading prior to it. Um, I'm 
picking up on some more modern, uh, more contemporary, contemporary issues. And so that's what I'm doing here in many ways. So I divide history up in three ways. I look at the closing the door, which is 24 to 65. I look at from 65 to 2001, which you'll see here soon. And I look at 2001 to the present. And I'm using that as an analytical lens, as an analytical lens. Now, 24 to 65, I won't go into details too much on this. Um, there's a lot of particularities behind this. But one of the things, you, it's, it's 1924, it's a Johnson-Reed Act that was passed, right? It's the Immigration Act of 1924. It is the most restrictionist period in U.S. history, favoring Northern Europeans, not favoring Eastern or Southern Europeans, definitely not fa favoring Jewish people, right? And it's based on nativistic ideas. We are returned back to this period, I think. We have returned back to this. It's definitely fueled by eugenics. It's also part of that. Right? You can go back. That's only 100 years ago. That's what's amazing. Um, but this is a restrictionist period. And one of the things is, think of, there's a racial script. I see immigration history as a racial script. It's always about exclusion. From 1790, right, with the Naturalization Act of 1790, right, from that moment on to the present, it's always about who is worthy and who is not worthy to enter into the U.S., right? That's what it's about, 1924. And so one of the, the racial scripts that I read, more or less, in a short way, is that we want more people that look like us. Not me, right? <laughs> White people. Right? That's the racial script. And every immigration policy between that period will be informed by that period, right? You can see the correlation also in biblical studies, right? But 24 to 65, more or less, right? Think of these borders, I uh, think of my delineation as porous. It's not, not fixed, right? They're porous. Here is a great scholar, Raymond Brown, right? Commentary, I've read all the commentary, I've read most of his works actually, because it's my field. Um, and I'm not picking on Raymond Brown per se, I'm picking, picking on the sense that to do biblical scholarship, you had to do it like Raymond Brown and other people like Raymond Brown, you see? You couldn't get a job if you didn't do it that way. That's the hidden language behind the field, the underpinnings of the field. I have colleagues who have lost jobs because they didn't do it the way Raymond Brown did it, right? And other scholars. Again, I'm not picking on historical criticism yet. Um, <laughs> uh, but it is, it is there, right? And so that's, that's the type of correlation. So in my paper, I tend to delineate that more, go into the nuances of what I'm trying to get across here. That's, that's what it is. You can see, if you read closely, how they saw people coming from different places. The caricature of this period, right? That's the way they communicated it back then. It's, it says a lot. Another very important period that I focus on and, and go much more in depth in here, um, actually, I ended up writing more, like 35 pages. I had the editor tell me I had to cut it way back. Um, I just got into it. Um, the second historical period is, is the opening the door. The first one was closing the door. This was opening the door, but not exactly was the opening the door, right? It's the Immigration and Nation Nationality Act of 1965, also called the Heart Seller Act. The Heart Seller Act. People, people like to think of this as when the U.S. began to open up. Not exactly, not exactly. If you look at the details behind it, right? But where 24 was about nationality quotas, this is about hemispheric quotas. And so they began to open up the U.S. across the globe with a preferential option with those people with professional skills. As we began to drain Africa and Asia in particular from the intellectual class, right? We're also feeding them in, uh, foreign aid at the same time, particularly in Africa. But 1970s, you can see the numbers just rise up in, um, um, fast, right? Rise up from migration from Africa in particular. Lawyers, doctors, right? These, the STEM field, right? And so what happens in, in, in many ways with this, this particular law, and there's other laws in this period, 86, IRCA, do you know IRCA, Immigration Reform and Control Act, amnesty to those who are undocumented. 96, under Clinton, the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant uh, Responsibility Act under President Clinton, right? Those are two different acts, those are immigration reform. IRCA's amnesty, 
Under Clinton, it's a, that's when you start the enforcement of the border. It really begins to get tighter and tighter. Also because of cable news. Think of, think of culture here. Cable news is now there on the, cor on the border, um, increasing the fees, I mean, fear, increasing fear of the people, not the fees. Fear, they probably did that too. Uh, um, but <laughs> it will have impact in biblical interpretation. We're not immune from this. Don't think of biblical interpretation as isolated from what's happening around us, right? It's happening. This is a racial script too. The racial script is that we are okay with some people coming, some people coming to the U.S., but they have to assimilate. They have to act and behave like us, right? That's the language I hear. This is my period right here, right? That's what I heard in school, assimilation. Lose your language if you want to belong. You see the Spanish, I mean, English-only laws pop up throughout the country, right? So that's what happens here. Reading from this place, social location, is, is a alternative script to respond to this period. All of a sudden, biblical scholars are writing their own scripts. They're not gonna follow the assimilationist model. They're gonna write their own script. This is one volume, there's a second volume, reading from this place, and if you want a little interesting um, information, I was the one behind organizing this conference. This one and the second one at Vanderbilt some years ago. Remember the fax machine? I used a lot of that, that, that back then. Um, and you remember that sound, right? So it's um, for those. Um, but anyway, that's, this, is, this is your alternative script, right? This is your Gloria Gaynor in 78 saying, I will survive, right? That's what's happening, right? Michael Jackson, man in the mirror, right? That's another one that you begin to see these self-expressions of people saying, no, 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 I'm gonna take a different way. A, good, a better example would be Lin-Manuel Miranda's, Miranda's um, Hamilton. That's an alternative way of reading Hamilton, you see? And that's happening, what's happening in the culture is also happening in the field of biblical studies. You can't understand this period without also understanding the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement will have a lot to do with this. I mean, listen to, to Sam Cooke's uh, lyrics and that will tell you a lot about this period right now so you know I like called, uh, music as you as you can tell um, so anyway that's one and then the last one just to get you it, um is the securing the door period right 2001 to the present this is another period I begin to focus on a little bit this was some one um, I think a student um, passed this on to me this is in Nogales um, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, where we took another trip to as well. And this is, it's marked by two, uh, 2001 because of the 9-11 terrorist attack on the U.S., right? It's all of a sudden the door gets secured, right? They get, there's, because of 9-11, there's a lot of reaction to border issues. 2002, you have the Department of Homeland Security established, right? 2006, under George, President George W. Bush, the Secure Fence Act. The first time they authorized 700 miles of a so-called border wall. Border barrier is probably a better term. That's what you see today when you go down to the border. It's the majority of that from that particular wall. 2012, DACA, right? The Deferred Action for Childhood Action, right? Under President um, uh, Barack Obama, right? In a reaction to some of the highest deportation records in our U.S. history, you see? That's another period. And then, of course, we get to more recent time with the President Donald J. Trump, right, with the Muslim travel ban in 2017, right? 2018, the zero tolerance policy, separation of children from families. 2019, migrant pro uh, protection protocols remain a Mexico policy. The Attempt to end TPS, temporary protected status, ICE enforcement, right? Public charge. And I read something recently that under his administration uh, is the most changes that we've ever had on immigration policy with the help of, if you know his writer, Stephen Miller, one of the policy advisors within the text, within, within um, the White House at that time. Right? You have to know U.S. history. 
you have to know U.S. history. And I would even argue that you can't understand today without understanding slavery in this country. You cannot. It is the same patterns. The same pattern. They separated children from family members during slavery, and now they're doing it again. You see? And they're doing it globally, too. You see? And I try to get this across to students. That we're all connected. What happens to me happens to you. What happens to the young boy happens to you. It's all relational, right? We can't think of them as an abstract. They are human beings, right? That's my theological principle as well. Everyone is made in the image of God. I play with that a lot. A counterscript, a counterscript is what you're seeing today, right? This is a counterscript that my, my dissertation advisor and I have co-edited recently. Right? But there's other counterscripts, right? The work that Dr. Thomas is doing is a counter, counterscript. The doctor th- that Dr. McNich is doing is a counterscript. The work that Amy is doing with Dr. Allen is doing with children is a counterscript. The work that Dr. Robertson and Dr. Bugs and Dr. Davis are counterscripts. Dr. Peterson, that's all counterscripts. Black Lives Matter is a counterscript. You see? And those, those young people who are marching in the streets of Dallas and New York and everything, protesting some of the immigration policy, those are counterscripts. We at CTS is about counterscripts, right? You want to know what liberal progressive theology is? That's it. That's a speck, speck among many other things about that, right? You just have to listen to Los, Tig- Los Tigres del Norte, listen to their lyrics. That's a counterscript. Ruben Blades, a counterscript. Beyonce formation, a counterscript. Taylor Swift, shake it off, a counterscript. You see, it's everywhere, but we need everyone to do that. We cannot do it alone. Otherwise, those young kids who are being separated from their families to this day will continue to be so. We have, we need counter narratives in our lives. Right? We all need to be part of it. And so what I used to tell students, jump on the train. Jump on the train, let's take us somewhere, together. That's what, that's what my project is all about. Thank you. President Malat, I, uh, how much time do I have for Q&A? Five minutes. Will you be the time monitor? Yeah. monitor? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, because I'm not very good at keeping time. So, it's, oh, wait a minute. We have someone up here helping me out. Aaron. Any questions? We could start a super PAC. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lozado. I just have a question of your last point there about the counterscript of contemporary music and um, also being a, a child of the 60s and wondering and knowing and watching generational shifts um, how um, the, the previous generation, one, doesn't welcome the new immigrants, but also the previous generation doesn't always welcome the counterscript of um, the contemporary music. And mm. I'm wondering how do you translate that to practical theology? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I ca- caught all of it, but, um, you know, I, the younger generation, it's, I've been studying this too. I mean, I think after COVID, of course, I think they have different ways of understanding. Um, and I'm trying to grasp what is that they understanding. I think there's a, a lot of, Less authority that the uh, toward the less respect for the ecclesiology. Let's put it that way, because the ecclesiology at times are struggling 
you know, I think they're struggling to get that message out to that younger generation. Um, I have, well, let me pick on my kids. Both of them ra were raised in a Christian home, but they know what I do, but they're skeptical because they know, they've heard Christian people preach hate. They preach hate. And why would they want to belong there? Why, why? I think the big question is, how do I reconcile for them? How do I reconcile to be part of this church when I don't see myself? You see, I think that's part of that. You know, I do use cultural studies a lot in, in my, well, when I taught undergrad, I used a lot, right? I used, used to make the argument, gospel, Mark, is your hip hop, right? Matthew is your classical. Luke is your social protest music, right? And John is your alternative music, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I try to connect with them to see, you know, like, I try to come where they were at. I think we need to come where they're at, to their world. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, for that younger generation, I think we have to listen. We can't, I mean, yeah, my, my values might be different from theirs, but... They're not looking, at least the kids that come to my home from through my kids, they're not looking at gender in binary way anymore, right? It's all social construction. It's a very challenging of authority. And I, of course, both my kids, I, I might pick up, they may not like it, I talk about them, but uh, <laughs> both of them have been in South Georgia on migrant farms. My daughter came to me with the southern, to the southern border as well. They're a part of the project that I'm a part of. So they have a very strong, strong social consciousness, um, and something I, you know, sort of instilled. My wife and I still in them, in many ways. So I guess I don't know if that answers your question, but I think the more I think about it, it's coming to where they're at, and we're not there always. Even the music and the our liturgy is very different from there. I mean, I, I can I I can resonate with some things, but they can't, right? So I, it's things like that. I wonder. I don't know for sure, but it's. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, very, very nice speech, Dr. Lozada. I wanted to ask, I think kind of what's kind of been hit on here is cognitive dissonance, right? You made a really uh, important point when you said whiteness kind of hinges on who you are. I think I would actually argue whiteness hinges on who you're not, and that mm -hmm. being the criteria for being at the front of the line. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really important because if we are not examining who we are at a fundamental social level, interpersonal level, I think that provides the cognitive dissonance to do things like preach hate in a, you know, wrapping mm -hmm. a testament of love, mm -hmm. um, or not really recognize when we are in like, just again, real dissonance with the things that we're following. So as we're creating these counterscripts, what would you suggest, not for the people who are trying to adhere to the counterscript, but for the people that are running into cognitive dissonance you know, with the counterscript, like the people that are in it, but they're not really recognizing how they're really divisive, you know, and they're really yeah, not yeah, uh, yeah. That's a good supporting question. their own you know, initiatives. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I've been thinking about that as well, and what, what do I do? I used to ride with, a, I, people who know me know that I like cycling a lot. And I had a really strong, I'm, I'm talking, you wouldn't, I mean, this was a very, very, very far right group that I rode with. And I was the, I was the oddball in the group, but I stayed in touch with them. Because during the rides, so those long 40, 60 mile rides, it was my time to talk to them. <laughs> and, and I would never give them what I thought. I asked questions. Why do you believe what you believe? Not what did you believe? Why do you believe what you believe, right? Van Harp, there's a book by 1965, Historian and the Believer. Um, and it's a, one of the best books on, I think, in theology um, to this day. It's a classic. If you trained in that period, you might remember it. Um, but it, it wasn't, it's not so much about belief. What, what did you believe? I wanted to know why they believed what they believed. And then I just started asking questions and asking questions. I call it effective questioning to try to get them to unravel why they believed what they believed, you know? And we would have these, 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 these conversations over and over and then, you know, it's, it's, that's how, that's one thing. The other thing is, is relationships. You know, some, some might hear this from me, but it, you gotta have, this, the reason why I go take students on the board because you have to, you have to, you have to be there. 
But you don't have to go to the border. The, actually, the border's here in Indiana. I've yeah, seen it. Yeah. I've met them. Um, so it's here. Um, and so, but I, it's that getting away from a place, getting somewhere else, and having that connection with people as a way to understand the, their experience. I mean, Schleiermacher talked about stepping in someone's shoes, right, the German philosopher, who's stepping in someone's shoes to understand their point of view, right? Those who do epistemology like Dr. Saylor. So it's that type of work, you know, that we have. We gotta connect the relationships my staff will know that. I like to talk to people face to face. So it's like, that's, I think that's important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. Yes. Do, you, do you think there's a little bit of theological niceness in the face of what seems to be an onslaught of uh, autocracy? Uh, should, should this not be a season where we're, yeah. where, where we're a little more yeah. even uh, radical yeah. in terms of our theological uh, uh, confrontation of yeah. what I think is an, an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms, Christian nationalism, yeah. but also this, this, this slow move, it's not even slow now, mm -hmm. uh, towards autocracy. Yeah, oh, oh, I would agree with you. I think we need, you know, I, I grew up in the 60s, mainly the 70s, 80s. I don't want to date myself. Um, <laughs> um, but I remember, I do remember, my uncle listened to Motown all the time. I listened to Motown. And I listened to those lyrics in the cars. We used to go to Detroit. And, and um, I went there also to play baseball a lot from Cleveland. But that's the, I, sometimes I wonder, we forgot history. And we have to go back to that period to understand what, it was they, what were they doing. And they were really in the face of, of vitriotic language and history at that time. And I do think theology is a little too nice. Mm -hmm. I think there's, what happened to the prophetic theologian? Mm -hmm. You know, I do wonder about that at times. And I think when we begin to, to ask, when they at meetings, right, at, at, at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature meetings, they say, well, you know, um, it's time to control yourself. Mm. You know, that's whiteness. They want, me to, they want me to be the genteel mm. theologian. Say it nicely. Say it nicely. So it's, that's, I do, think, I do wonder about that, that, you know, and I would like to see more of that more radical um, uh, positioning, if that's, if that's what, you, what you're suggesting here. So thank you. Now, oh, there's. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Lozada. Mm -hmm. And I know you as Frankie. This is Marilyn, in case you didn't oh, know. Oh, Marilyn, Marilyn. <laughs> Marilyn. That, she is the, uh, Val, that's my cousin. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, so proud of you and so proud to be here. But I want to just mention that I always say that nice is a tool of the devil. Yeah. We are called to be kind. Nice uh, is fake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I want to say that, uh, speaking to what you were talking about, yeah. um, and this whole idea of whiteness and mm -hmm. all this, and knowing stories, um, the mm -hmm. accountability, you know, mm -hmm. I grew up with you, yeah, same yeah. church, Catholic, yeah. I'm not yeah. Catholic anymore, yeah. but it broke my heart when I went to seminary and learned of uh, mm -hmm. the church's complicity yeah. in all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And so where, where would you say accountability is still necessary, and how mm -hmm. do we continue to decolonize what we've done so that people aren't uh, turned away by Christianity because of what we've done, but are turned towards Jesus because of how we're living. Mm. Hmm. That's my cousin. <laughs> she lived right down the street. And I haven't seen her in years, actually. So it's um, um, now a UCC minister in Chicago. Um, and so thank you. Um, yeah, you know, that's a good question. I wish I had all of you in my seminar. Um, <laughs> these are great questions. You know, I think for me, it's knowing. I don't know, I, I just, I'm an academic deep down. I wanna go back to history. I wanna know, you know, I, 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 had my born, I was born again in August, I can tell you when, right? Good evangelical, <laughs> that I should have been. August 1988, I was born again. Born, really, anew. Anothen in Greek, right? It's the first time my consciousness was raised about who I was. And it has someone finally acknowledged my voice and my identity. I didn't have to play the game, you see. 
And that's history. So that forced me to go back to the 60s. You know, read everything on, on, on um, the black movement, the Puerto Rican movement, the Chicano movement. I went back there. I think the youth don't have, I mean, our government, right, Florida, Texas, they're trying to get rid of that. Right? They're trying to get rid of that. But they're also forgetting the role of the church in the fights for liberation in Central America and Latin America. And students, I mean, I, I, it, it's not fair. The curriculum, it's not in the curriculum as well. So it's, that's the type of stuff I'm hoping to do here is to bring some of those voices back. Well, I think they're, I think they're well, they've been here. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, that's the type of stuff. I wonder if that's the accountability. I think we need to know back, I think we need to know our history. I think it was, I think it was at Dr. Bug's church where I went to a website and they're doing a black history. They're teaching black history. That's what churches need to do, you know, because the state government is beginning to take that away. We can't let that go. We can't let that go. And, we do, and Latino, Latina churches need to do more of that too. Remember, the, you know, trying to go back and remember our history. So, thank you. Um, it's up to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Time That's a our, quick our, one. Our yeah, yeah, has yeah, another yeah, yeah, thank you. So, let's thank Dr. Lozada, Dean thank Lozada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations and thank you. I hope you'll all join us in the common room for a, re a reception. And if you have questions, you can certainly line up and talk to to Dr. Lozada after he gets a drink of water. And I hope you'll return uh, on April 11th for the last CTS talk at CTS. Thank you and God bless you. Um, Dr. Lozada, uh, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk. And as our last song to say bye and to praise God for this moment and for your life, we'd like to sing a song called Son al Rey, or Song to the King. And the words that uh, we will be singing are based on Psalm 103 that says, Powerful uh, King of Kings, majestic, powerful, uh, praised, and uh, blessed be your name for centuries to come. Um, praise the Lord, my soul, praise his whole name, and do not forget all of his benefits. He who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed.
poderoso y majestoso mi señor y yo a ti te canto un son pa que me bendigas de noche de día pa que me Señor, mi libero y me lo son. Él te quita toda angustia, mi Señor. En ti consciente te protege, oh mi Dios. Es poderoso y majestuoso, mi Señor. Y yo a ti te canto son. más te digo yo y te muestre su grandeza mi señor te hace justicia y te colma con sus penes y rescatarte los caminos y yo te canto a ti y yo te canto a ti mi buen pastor tú me diste la alegría y valor son y le vas Toda angustia, Santo Dios, es poderoso y majestuoso, mi Señor. Y yo a ti te canto, son.